welcome. And I'm going to talk about this slightly long title. Um, what this is about is um, a project called City Exchange that we've been does this work that we've been doing for the last five years. Uh, it's a European project around energy mobility, climate transition, energy transition, citizen involvement, citizen participation. And this is one small aspect I wanted to present here that's about mobility. And I'll explain some of the details of what actually the whole part of the title means then later on as we go through. And yeah, let me start with uh, something, something smaller. Uh, this is Trondheim, this is in Norway. Uh, we are at NTNU, we are the largest university in the country, but it's a small country. And we are a very engineering based institute. So almost every engineer you will find in Norway will have been educated at NTNU. Um, myself, I have a computer science background, which is also why I'm here, but I'm now working in the Department of Architecture and Planning, where we do a lot of the smart city projects that the university is running. And we are working very multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary to make things work in living lab settings. So we build our project groups in a way that we have in the best case, always cities that help us that are in the lead to work locally. We have industry partners, we have academia, all the usual ones, but we really try to do things on the ground together with cities and industry to have a different type of impact. And then what we do is a lot of action research around that, a lot of systems development, a lot of testing, but with a very strong view towards replication or towards something that makes sense for either industry partners or the cities themselves to implement it or to do further. So this is a view of Trondheim in autumn. Uh, it's a small-ish place, especially by Asian standards. Uh, we have about 200,000 people population out of that, like depending how you count, 20 to 30,000 students in our main university and in a few other places. And you can see up here the university buildings, one of them, some other places are down here and a few in the city center as well. Uh, we you see our cathedral, uh, which is the largest stone buildings up in the Nordics. And yeah, you see here also the city looks smallish, friendly, livable, a lot of green. Um, and this is one of the areas we work on, we mostly work with mid-sized cities that have different types of issues and challenges than some of the larger ones, some of the mega cities. So coming from there to Singapore, of course, is quite a difference. And I'm sure some of these things will look very different if implemented here or they are already running in some way or other. Um, of course, also around mobility, Singapore has quite an advanced mobility system that it needs and a lot of work there goes just into operating it and making sure you keep that running. Uh, here we, we can be a bit more experimental in what we do and we are not necessarily quite that advanced on the integrated mobility of everything. Also because Norway is a very low populated country so there are very many rural areas. We are still working on smart cities as where things happen but we try to think also of what does this mean for the other areas? And most of the country is very lowly populated. So we have a very strong mix of issues there. So basically, if you go out of the city center, um, after 20 minutes, you're out in the forest. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with also these very closely, like spatially close outlying regions to integrate them? So yeah, some background. Um, this is one of the definitions we are using for what actually is a smart city. So there is not the single one thing. What we are doing is kind of the third point there. We try to bring these different perspectives together, technology, people, institutions, so that we are working in this environment as a very complex, very dynamic environment with a lot of legacy stuff that is just happening there. We try to do integration across systems of systems. We try to develop new things that makes sense within the environment we find. And yeah, the final result here should be a more livable city, better services, better offerings. Um, and one of the 
large current issues, of course, also emission reduction, climate neutrality, decarbonization. So around that, some of the stuff that then cities want, that we want, that we support, is a shift towards more sustainable modes of transportation, meaning getting away from privately owned combustion vehicles, um, finding different ways of using also space. So again, we're working with a lot of different groups. So this is also around mobility planning, urban planning that is already happening uh, in the cities and bridge that with other interests, with other ideas. Um, so things like mobility as a service, mobility on demand, something app-based, cars, buses, uh, electric scooters, rental bikes, all these things, finding out different ways to do one transportation need with different modes of transportation. So it also helps you get away from needing a car for everything. Um, reduction of emission intense transportation modes, of course, as well. And one thing that's just happening kind of automatically is the shift to electric vehicles, which for the Trondheim cases in our project, we kind of take as a given. Uh, Norway has given enormous subsidies on electric vehicles. So now it's one of the leading countries in the world with electric vehicles, with charging infrastructure. Um, so it's also a bit the lab for at least Europe there. Norway, of course, is also rich. So what they did in terms of subsidies was Basically, if you buy a combustion vehicle in Norway, you have a tax on it that's almost 100% of the value of the car, which is really heavy, which is really painful, which also led to a lot of really, really old cars still driving around. So around 10 years, which is also the time I came to Norway, but it's, I don't think there's a causation, um, they changed the, the, the rules uh, to incentivize cars, electric ones, by basically taking, taking the tax off. So suddenly you got half the price of car. And they fixed also a lot of the charging infrastructure in a very pragmatic way. And one of the things I like about working in Norway is that a lot of actors are very pragmatic in fixing things. And then they are just fixed. And you only hear about it if you actually ask someone because, well, it's fixed, why should we talk about it? <laughs> Which can make it also sometimes quite difficult to figure out what is already there, what is in place, what has worked, but have you tried what failed, what worked? Uh, so charging infrastructure in the basis is kind of there. It's very integrated. Um, originally, I'm from Germany. If I try to get a car there, I need so many different apps and different charging cards, and then they still don't work with the charger. And like, oh, this is the wrong one, or it's not on because it's not connected, or its internet connection is broken, so I can't charge. N none of that really happens in Norway somehow. It's just very pragmatic and it's fixed. The integration and the user experience and just getting things done is quite strong there. Um, so there's also things then like gas stations will go away at one point, but in the meantime, we need to bridge things. So chargers are already there. Uh, plants are there to basically put chargers on every parking spot that is there because that's what you will have to have at one point anyway. So it's a bit ahead of the curve. In some cases, it doesn't work so well. Um, one anecdotal example there, for example, if you have, if you live in, a, in an apartment building, normally they are commonly owned by the inhabitants. And energy was so cheap for a long time in Norway that you didn't have your own energy meter. You only had a common flat rate bill because energy was so cheap but that doesn't work anymore if you need to put in your electric vehicle. You cannot charge that and have everyone else pay for it. So that was really a problem. Um, in some cases, you got individual meters. In other cases, oh, th there is a charging company that does this for all other parking spots anyway. So then what comes up is the chargers outside the building are operated by a separate company that runs their own meter and builds you on that because it still doesn't make sense to put your individual smart meter into the building for every apartment. So there's a lot of issues like that that also happen in other places, but that can really be used to bring things forward. Um, yeah, then uh, the other part of also what I'm doing in the work in our group is shift in urban planning mode. So what does this demand of urban planning, of the way the cities are built, um, different approaches of increased density, increased mixed use, kind of like the 15 minute city. So having a lot of functions close to you so you can reach them easily. You don't need a lot of transportation needs. Um, so this is something that a lot of my colleagues and are working on and what we're doing in 
our work in the group and in the projects here is to bring these things together and to see, okay, what are the cross dependencies? What happens if we do urban planning on the one side, if we do energy planning, if we do mobility planning, how can we get away from these silos and try to bridge them, have them talk to each other, use tools to allow that. So if you plan an upgrade or you plan a new district, what do you need? You need charging spaces. You can have parking spaces inside that need that. Um, you need different ways of bike paths, of bus stops and so on. So bringing all this together is uh, something that is then really the, the urban planning side of things. Um, then also behavior shifts, again, things like 15 minute cities and others to make it easier to do the things we kind of all know we should be doing. Um, then also with the increase of data that always comes, uh, understanding better traffic patterns, emission patterns, and also helping this, feeding this data back into urban planning, um, mobility planning, and so on. So we are now at a stage where it's a bit easier to get uh, mobility data out of the mobile phone companies, for example. So there are some projects running there to use that and to see how can that actually change urban planning. And the timelines, they are always quite difficult because urban planning does something that takes five or 15 years to plan and build, which then stays there for 50 or 100 years. So the timings are difficult. The disciplines have very different time scales and what they think is fast. So we're also trying to bridge that. Um, and then, yes, one of the specific items here I want to show is um, positive energy districts. This is uh, the easier graphic of what this is. The idea here is to do a very hyper-local energy transition. So instead of relying on the large centralized power plants or then the more decentralized renewable power plants, the idea here is to maximize the potential locally you have in neighborhoods for any energy measures. That means upgrading of buildings, retrofitting them to reduce the energy demand, locally producing renewable energy because they are less disruptive than on the grid. They need a bit less work on the larger scale. So it means putting up solar panels on your roof while you're upgrading your roof because you need to insulate it, trying to do that all together because then the solar panels basically cost nothing anymore. Um, linking that with geothermal, uh, we haven't done urban wind, but we have done urban uh, water turbines in a river. Um, linking that with storage, both for district heating and then for electricity. So that also means larger batteries within the city that can balance locally the energy needs and the surplus. So the normal batteries we are using there, it's a container battery, which basically takes out the daily rhythm. It doesn't take weekly or even seasonal storage. That's then done elsewhere outside this local system. And then the added thing here is also, if we do this mobility needs, generate energy needs. So either I'm living in the area, or I'm working there, so that's where my mobility need comes from. So I can also cover that with the area that's there. So, and then basically what I mentioned before, so having better mobility options, having better public transport, electrifying public transport, electrifying all the cars that all comes together. Even if we have electric cars in Norway, almost everywhere and the chargers everywhere, it still has quite a drain on the energy grid. So being able to locally cover that helps to balance the grid, helps to make it also cheaper elsewhere. So you don't have to upgrade the whole electricity grid. And cars are still okay. They are a bit smaller. They don't all necessarily charge at exactly the same time, but a little bit of smart charging there already helps. If we're talking then about electrification of other means, electric buses have a much higher energy demand. If you plug them in, you can see it on your substation that you plugged in your bus. And we have electric ferries coming up. A lot of the car ferries that go across the different fjords that are the replacement for the roads, everything that goes up to half an hour to the other side can be electrified. And it charges with like really huge suction charger. So the it drives just up uh, and it charges within five or 10 minutes. So that has also massive energy demand. And in the Trondheim area, one of the test beds here is the harbor which currently still has uh, diesel electric ones because they are the fast ferries that need much higher energy density for wider pathways. But they're one of the 
issues from the energy grid is that if we electrify all the ferries and we don't do anything smart about their charging, the grid will break down, which means millions and millions in grid infrastructure. So by being able to connect all this, we're able to save quite a lot of money and to bridge the different mobility modes. And then we are also able to predict the energy demands because you know pretty well these days where the buses are. We have a moving object database of all buses in Norway. Uh, that database came live around two years ago. So you can predict pretty well when they would be at your station and when they would charge. Uh, similar then for ferries and others. Um, the cars are then a bit outside, especially private cars, they are rather unpredictable. We're trying to do something there with commercial fleets. So the cars that are there for one company or for a, a number of companies within one building. So doing the prediction on that allows you to really fine tune also the rest of your energy demand. And then of course, also the other parts here of being able to um, improve the area while you're doing this uh, for pedestrians, for bikes, for electric scooters, for everything else that comes up. Electric bikes, we just charge. That doesn't make a big difference, but you need to have the right charging points and the right uh, parking structures for that as well to be able to do that. And so we integrate there quite a lot, the mobility part where we just think this is an asset. It doesn't matter really what it is, but it has a different volume. So having your building set up there with its solar panels, with, the, with its battery, with its different consumers within the building, or you have the cars, the buses, they just, from a very simplified system view, they just look like batteries that sometimes are not there, that might break. In the, in the simplest case, you can even just model that as a case of failure. Suddenly the battery is off. But in most cases, you know better when it will come and when it will go off. So it's possible to really run very nice prediction models on that and to improve the whole system. So then we have a number of things here where we integrate that with the trading between the buildings and with optimizing the whole grid. And then what we are able to build out of that in the end is uh, a small demo so far. It is growing. That helps to decarbonize transport. And it does this very important integration of the mobility needs with the energy, which will also come up in all other countries, or it's already coming up really strongly. So then being able to link the charging, running the predictions on the backside, um, having that basically all the energy assets that are there somehow connected, somehow being linked on the internet to be able to run them through a common backend. Um, and to plug things in. And one item here as well, I mentioned the batteries that need to be pretty large for now, uh, but there is something quite nice that is two-way charging. It's called vehicle to grid or vehicle to building. Not that many cars can do it yet, uh, but more and more are able to, or you have to unlock it specifically. So for now we can only do it, uh, not to advertise too much with Nissan Leafs that we have because they just have it built in as a standard configuration. And then we are able to use the cars in their downtime as a battery. So we get rid of the large batteries that we otherwise have to put out in the street. And then we make space for different parking, for bike parking, for public parks. Because otherwise, uh, based on our calculations, it would be plastering the city with, <laughs> with batteries. But they are basically there with all the cars. So being able to integrate them is then a quite strong value proposition and so far in the tests and also in something that the car manufacturers themselves are building, it's not a big issue. The, the batteries don't decay that much because you usually don't discharge the whole battery at once. You have enough cars, you distribute it. You just need a little bit basically for the flexibility. So there we don't want to get rid of all the cars because then we realize we need them. Um, we also need the bus cars and the, the bus batteries sometimes. So we are able to do all that. And on the other side, we are also making a better service offer for the customers, so for the inhabitants, uh, by having an integrated backend system that connects the, the moving object database for the buses, for ferries, for others. It does prediction models on the car fleet. So we have set up a specific car sharing model here which uses the cars that are assigned by one of the car sharing companies that are assigned to a building for all its commercial 
uh, tenants there, they need a fleet, but they don't need all their own fleet. So we already reduced the number of cars there by having one managed larger fleet for the area. And then what happens in the businesses on the weekend or after five or six, everyone goes home. So at that point, we can add those cars to the free market of car sharing to everyone else to do it for the employees to take the car home or to take it over the weekend for other people to come in. So there is now a much more dynamic offer also on car sharing, which also reduces again the number of cars in a way because most private people, when they want to rent a car, it might be on the weekend to get out to somewhere, which is where the commercial fleet doesn't do anything. So we're able to optimize that. So we have the connection of the back end. It's available on a website. It's available also for the businesses to fine tune a bit more their availability to rent things out or not. And of course, there's an app. There's always an app uh, to merge these together. So, and then a lot of the work here was also to adapt the individual back end. So the car sharing company. Uh, they all have a black box or like a telematic box that allows you to remotely unlock the car that gives you some data on it. Uh, it needs to now be upgraded that it also gives you the charging status of the car as it drives around so you know better what to predict. You also know better when you can rent it out again if someone drove the battery empty. So all these ways of doing it, then we worked with one large uh, car rental company uh, that didn't have any of that yet. You just go, you get a key, you use it like a normal car. So they then upgraded that, that they can now do a shared rental and car sharing model to be able to run this also in a different way and put cars out in a different way, which again reduces the amount of cars on the streets or well, mostly parked. A lot of them are just parked. They're using our parking spaces. But then for those that remain, again, we are able to use their batteries for something. And then we are able to connect all these different things in an app that by now we have four different car rental companies, large ones in there. We still have neighborhood car sharing. That's a different system. But we have city bikes that are operated partly by the city. We have three companies that run e-scooters in the city. We have the buses, the ferries, the airplanes, because unfortunately Norwegians still use the airplane like a bus because the country is too big. Uh, the trains and other things. So we merged all these together in a different setup of the back end, the front end, the way we understand the users, or we hope we understand them, and we connect different commercial and municipal entities together. And one thing out of this that will happen then later this year is, for example, that the municipality of Trondheim uh, that has an, a huge number of cars, they have normal cars for people to get around, they have transportation vehicles, they have vans, we will also put most of their cars then into the system so that also their downtime is reduced. Um, they make better use of their cars and open it up to the population. Um, that goes then above what was done already before in the project to try different things. So there was a very nice scheme, for example, on renting out electric vans as a test object. If you're a company or you're a private person and you want to see if this fits for you, you can go and rent it from the city for, for a week or a month to test if it would work for you. And otherwise you just give it back. If not, you can go and rent it then from another company or buy your own. So these different ways of running the incentives, not just the thing I mentioned at the beginning by basically cutting all the tax off, but finding different ways there also to engage and to find out really what are the needs. Because private cars are kind of a solved problem, but Commercial ones are still a bit of an issue. People are not sure if it would really work. So this is a way to do it. Then uh, cargo bikes, now we can share uh, cargo bikes, electric ones, because Trondheim is very hilly. If you have a cargo bike, you don't really do the pedal that up and down, which is funny enough then rented out by the city library and by its separate stations. So there also it's a way like what works best, what can we do to keep up the or to match the mobility need of everyone in here. And yeah, then I want to show a few things how this looks like in practice. So these are the Trondheim demonstrators. This is a harbor front I was talking about. This is actually when it's good weather. Um, I took a lot of good picture, uh, good weather pictures here because that's when the pictures go better. I don't expect it to always look like this. Um, this is uh, the big black box here is uh, 
uh, one of the positive energy buildings. So this produces more thermal and more electric energy than it needs itself and is bridging that to the other buildings around it out of the project we ran here. And we also show some parts of the mobility in here as well. Um, there are charging spaces in the basement of the building, which makes it much easier to install. And then we jump a bit in the integration because the charges are integrated directly into the building electricity system. They are integrated into the building management system, which is quite a complicated piece of software and a few boxes all over. It's also available publicly, then part of it on the internet uh, or for the other providers that need to see the state, the charging status of the cars, which either comes from the building management system, from the charging station or from the car because they all have different APIs, they have different ways of doing it. In some cases, you have to go back to the API of the car manufacturer because their cloud system has the data you actually want from the car that's in your basement. So a lot of the work here is really then on integration, getting the right standards. You think everything has an internet connection, it's easy. Unfortunately, it's not yet that standardized. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, how not standardized is this? This is a very simplified version of all the different demonstrators we did. A lot of them are running on the same databases, on the same systems, um, are bridging uh, different, different aspects of this. So we have here the whole electromobility and mobility parts. It links to the positive energy blocks with the local trading with a lot of other parts around here. Um, and it goes down to some of the hardware here we have. So the electric vehicles, the charging hubs, uh, some of the back end, we have batteries here. And they are kind of a little bit the same now by being able to use some of the car batteries and a lot of structure in between. So wait, there we go. No. There. So we have a lot of common things there. We don't have the one city platform for all the data. We have a more federated approach, but the, the ability to connect then the different systems that exist with original city data, with some of the mobility data, some of this also from then the, the providers of the cars, not all the data is available. So you have to find ways around that, some specific legal agreements, uh, some specific APIs to be able to get at least the data you need. Um, also to get out afterwards some specific data here, um, again, as a data dump, as an access to some GIS over the web or something else for the city to use the data here also for better urban planning, for understanding how mobility then happens in the city. So it's very integrated. So this is just this one very small vertical here. Um, this is, okay, this is almost readable. Uh, this is then one use case only for the, for the integrated mobility part. This is the more generic structure. Um, and this is the more detailed one of how, almost how it was implemented then at the end. So you see quite a lot of different systems. This is how unfortunately it still works and looks like in real life. And we managed to combine all these things by trying to also standardize a lot of the APIs, standardizing the access between the systems, and then also being able to connect all these partners. And very little of that in the end could just be done on a pure API basis. A lot of that needed agreements, needed discussions to actually build them in the right way because they were not all necessarily there. Um, we had this very nice database uh, for all public transport in Norway, um, which was supposed to come online four years ago. It only came up two. And at first it had quite a delay. It was supposed to be real time every 30 seconds. The first iteration came with like half an hour delay and one, one update every hour. So that also broke a lot of things here because we were building on different expectations. Um, in the end, that got also fixed, but also there again, a lot of the collaboration and having not just the industry partners here, but also the municipality and a bit us then push on the national regulator that was building the systems and finding out ways to do that. And on the other side, also being able to build a system that demonstrates then the value of this at the beginning, they were, for example, making the data available. They had a nice website where you could get the data. There wasn't 
a way to get the raw data. You just had a visualization. So this also helps them to show that there's actually demand and you need this. So it also helped prioritize some of the work there. Yeah, then I show just a few more examples before I close. So this is next to the building I showed before. It's on the right, the big black block. Uh, this is one of the electric vehicles at the uh, end station here. And that's a charger that comes down from the top, connects to the bus. And the bus driver has a button there to get the charger down and connect. Um, but our backend system can predict when the bus is there. We can't predict when the bus driver presses the button, but it's then rather exact to understand when this battery would, well, when the bus would come and want to charge this battery. We're not discharging the buses, but this has a massive energy demand. So if we roughly know already from the general schedule, but then also from the direct position data, it allows us on the back end to pre-charge the battery. That's one street over to then have enough juice there to fill up the bus uh, without having any other disruptions. And this is something that's quite complex to do, but then once it runs, you basically have different prediction models running on the different energy assets. And here you need to just be careful that it's always different ones. It's not the same bus that comes, so you can identify them in some way, but not in all the way we want. So we still have to t try this out. And when it's disconnected, we have a rough idea, but also in some cases it disconnects a bit earlier or later. So it's always part of that to have a bit of a failure mode of, well, the battery is gone, we can deal with that. Um, then next part here, um, this is then two parts of the charging system. One is um, in the basement here. Um, yeah, and you see these are all the Nissan Leafs. Uh, this is the same charger then as this one. Uh, that is the, so the ones here that are normal chargers, just one way. These are the vehicle to grid charging and discharging one. Um, also, these have been prototypes that are now on the market. And they are using the uh, Charimo uh, standard here for the plug, which allows them to plug in. And then in this case, also, we have the battery, a smaller one right next to the parking lot. Um, which makes for better photo opportunity. Otherwise, it doesn't make a big difference where it is, if, as long as it's close and kind of still within the area, within the substations. And also here, if you would plug this in, like here, it is quite tricky to do that. You think that's obvious, you plug it in, it works. The car and the charger communicate to a little extent over the cable, but mostly on, well, how much do you want to charge with which duration with voltage and so on, but understanding how full the battery is and when to charge, when to do smart charging is kind of run by a different backend system elsewhere. And that has to then kind of get those two things back together again. And it runs partly through a commercial partner that runs the system and it runs through the car rental company systems as well. So we would like to just have this very science fiction, just you plug it together and it works. But there is a lot of other stuff in the way, and also the way this connects is rather complicated. So, but still, try it, it's worth it. And then, yeah, some of the interfaces, we have also, of course, a web interface. I just quickly want to show the, the app here. So it has all the different ways of, of putting things together. Like where are all your options to do mobility? So you have a lot of um, rental cars here, car sharing buses are clustered all around us stations. You also have a lot of the sharing bikes and e-scooters are not on this map yet. They are on the one over here. You can also select which ones you want, which abilities there are, and then you are able to either th do things directly in here or jump to the other app that allows you to. Um, if you want to rent a car, they want to know that you're a real person that has a driver's license, so that's not possible in the app here. For some others, it's starting. Also at the beginning, we were not able at all to sell any tickets to this. Um, so the integrated mobility of having one ticket for my whole part, like starting with the bike, going to the bus, using that to go to the ferry, wasn't possible because of some national legislation that doesn't allow you to further sell bus tickets because they wanted to protect the buses. <laughs> 
And so no one else, apparently there was some case where someone cheated and sold bus tickets for more expensive through a weird system. So they banned that, which also means we were banned here. We only found that out a while after. But so this whole integration across the different systems then allows you to do something that looks in the end really, really simple, which it should to be user-friendly and usable there. But the backend is much more complicated of that. And to make these connections, to have the prediction models, to have the right data standards, to have the right uh, front end and back end systems that allow you to do this is quite critical. Um, yeah, then very quickly here for the results. So yeah, overall, um, we did this integration and it works. It's still running. Um, some, others, uh, some other companies are even starting to copy our platform. On, well, they copy the app, they can't quite copy the platform yet. Um, but being able to integrate this, not just on a data or systems level, but on an organizational level, uh, the different users, the different domains that are needed for this is quite critical. And this is one of the demos we do to show like how a future energy system would work which is also very much web mediated and across a lot of different systems that are there. So uh, doing this hyper local energy and then mobility transition is possible. We have now a running demo for that. And yeah, it goes to all the items I said before, you need the collaboration. Uh, it helps on the decarbonization goals. Um, it in the best case also increases livability. It makes the system more future proof for the people that live in the areas. We are doing more data analytics on this now as more data is coming in to see how that can be better used than also for other needs that the municipality has. And this is still slowly growing more other companies, uh, more other services are being integrated here. Yeah, and then if you wanna know more about how all of this fits together, um, this is a final report from that project, our How to Pet Cookbook. Uh, this has all the different aspects in how all this is integrated, including, of course, the mobility, including the different analytics and backend systems. And with that, I want to also thank the rest of the team. So that's the four authors of this paper. Um, a lot of this is based on some internal documentation. So one much more detailed deliverable from the project. It's also cited in the, in the paper itself. If you want to know any of the very technical, dirty details, how this was done. And of course, the whole of the project team here that contributed and gave input and built stuff or just tested things out in the wild. So thanks very much. Uh, find me here or ask me any questions.